It's wonderful to have you in worship this evening. We're glad for each one of you that have come out to worship the Lord together with us. And we're looking forward to what God has for us tonight in the service. And uh, isn't it a beautiful day? Amen. Amen. I haven't gotten over Sunday night service, have you? Yeah. God's good to us, isn't he? Oh, we thank him for his blessing. Brother Brandon, Arthur, will you stand and ask the blessing on the service? Howard will come and lead us and sing it. Turn to page 64, 64, he brought me out.
And I feel fire from above And I've been down to the river I ain't the same The prodigal return I've worn shackles and chains And I've been freed and forgiven I'm not going back, I'll never be the same Breaks him down to his knees And God, I've been broken more than a time or two Yes, I have But you pick me up and show me what it means to be a man That's why I sing all my hope is in Jesus
table There's nothing he ain't seen before For all your sins, all your sorrow and your sadness There's a Savior and He calls Bring it all to the table He can see the weight you carry The fears that hold your heart But through the cross you've been forgiven You're accepted as you are so bring it all to the table There's nothing he ain't seen before For all your trials, all your worries and your burdens There's a Savior and he calls Bring it all to the table Bring it all There's no one who's turned away All you sinners, all you saints Come right in and find your grace Come on in, take your place There's no one who's turned away All you sinners, all you saints Come on in and find your grace and Bring it all to the table nothing he ain't seen before for your sins your sorrow and your sadness there's a savior and he calls bring it all to the table seen the mountain of their sins just disappear for anyone who's ever felt the hand of heaven reach down through their fears and dry their tears for any life once empty now finds itself alive and full of songs victory songs then you'll understand the reason for the way the saints of God, they carry on. So if I shout, no, I'm shouting from a heart that's been washed clean. If I run, no, I'm running from a past that's been redeemed to a world it might look crazy. There's just no telling what you're going to do. That moment Jesus gets a hold of you. For anyone who knows the hope keeps him moving on through troubled days. For anyone who knows they've got a future and a hope beyond the grave. Oh, every life's a different story of how he brought us out of darkness into the There's no way to keep us silent. Every breath's an 
another chance to testify, testify. If I shout, no, I'm shouting from a heart that's been washed clean. If I run, no, I'm running from a past that's been redeemed. To the world, it might look crazy, but there's just no telling what you're gonna do. In that moment, Jesus gets a hold of you. Carry on now, my brothers. Carry on now, my sisters. Carry on now, my brothers. Carry on now, my sisters. Carry on now, my brothers. Carry on now, my sisters. Carry on now, my brothers. Carry on now, my sisters. If I shout, no, I'm shouting. For my heart that's been washed clean. If I run, no, I'm running. For my past has been redeemed. To the world, it might look crazy. There's just no telling what you're gonna do. In that moment, Jesus gets a hold of you. He gets a hold of you. The Lord is good, isn't he? Praise God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Share a little preaching, teaching with you tonight, if that's okay. And uh, we thank God for what he's been doing in the church. He's so good to us. And uh, there's some things that you may not need this now, but I would advise you to jot it down, tuck it away in your mind, whatever you can do. Just don't let the devil take it from you because you will need it. And uh, I'm, I'm dealing with something that's it's fundamental. And, and here's the problem. When I say the first point or two, you can interpret it the wrong way because some people only go uh, one or two points into this and they build their whole doctrine or their doctrinal system around it. And that's not my intent to do that tonight. But... Uh, I'll explain a little more of that as we go along. It's a very familiar passage, but I think it's, it's a great truth that it's not hidden, it's very obvious, but it's a truth that we all need, and when we apply it effectively, I promise you, it works. And I'll be going to the fifth chapter of Mark, and I'll be reading from the fifth chapter of Mark in just a few moments, uh, but, uh, but before I read, let me just give you a little introduction if I can to the message I think if there's anything that is really really missing in the church and I'm talking about the church the church of the living God and the church is not the building it's the people but if there's anything that's missing in the people's lives and hearts in this modern day church, it's principles. Not principle like at a church, at a school, principles. And there's a difference between a principle at a school and principles in our life. A principle, I guess probably the basic definition, you all know it, it's just a fundamental truth or a fundamental law upon which everything else is built upon it. And it's all based on that fundamental truth or truths as they interlock together. There's such a significance to our principles because if you have principles, please hear this, if you have principles, you have just cut your worry time by at least 70 or 80%. 
and you've cut your decision-making time by probably that same amount. And the reason that I say that is principles are already in place before you get to certain situations and the principle makes the decision for you. So that means that if I have fundamental truths from the Bible and then I'm approached with a situation that contradicts that fundamental truth, I don't have to give it a second thought, I know what I'm doing. I can never get in a gray area, I can never do wrong, but you have to be proactive to do that. Principles are like the foundation of this building. This is a wonderful building, but if we didn't have a foundation under it, and by the way, we can't have a foundation on one wall or on the back wall or the front wall or this side wall, it takes all of that foundation to support this building. So our whole life, if you, will, if you will grasp these principles from this passage that I share with you tonight, I promise you, you will receive all spiritual blessings and also your material and physical needs will be met. Notice I said needs. But they will be met because this is the principles that God gives us in our word, but these you can't just take one, they're interlocking. So as I give you these, I hope that you understand that they're interlocking and you have to have the whole thing together or else you've just got half a foundation, three quarter of a foundation. You don't have a whole foundation for your life. But if we apply these personally, it, it'll make the difference for us. And before I start, I wanna say this. God doesn't need principles because he is the sum of all things. And he is the foundation of all things. God makes no wrong choices. We do. <laughs> That's why we have to have these principles in place to know what to do when we're confronted. And it can be, you can be confronted by a multitude of things. But the principles will make the decision for you. Now this particular woman that I'm reading about in Mark chapter five, I'll begin reading with the 24th verse and read maybe just 10 or 11 verses to you. And as we go along, if you underline, some of you may not be comfortable underlining, but I'm gonna mention just a few words because these words are important in trying to find these principles for our life. We read in Mark 5, 24, and Jesus went with him and much people followed him. And these are key words, and thronged him. So it's evident there's a crowd. Where Jesus is at, there'll always be a crowd because things are happening where Jesus is at. And when he's not there, it's just misery. But the people were drawn to him because they were seeing things happen that they couldn't see happen any other way. And verse 25, and a certain woman, which had an issue of blood 12 years, and had suffered many things of many physicians, and had spent all that she had, and was nothing bettered, but rather grew worse. When she heard of Jesus, she came in the press behind and, underline these three words, touched his garment. For she, she, for she said, underline those three words, for she said, if I may but touch his clothes, I shall be whole. And straightway, the fountain of her blood was dried up. And, underline this phrase to the end of the verse, she felt in her body that she was healed of that plague. And Jesus immediately knowing in himself that virtue had gone out of him, turned him about in the press and said, who touched my clothes? And his disciples said unto him, thou seest the multitude thronging thee and sayest thou who touched me? And he looked round about to see her that had done this thing. But the woman fearing and trembling knowing what was done in her, came and fell down before him and, underline this phrase, told him all the truth. And he said unto her, Daughter, thy faith hath made thee whole. Go in peace and be whole of thy plague. Now, I, I'm, I'm gonna break this down. I won't keep you very long tonight. At least I don't plan to. I didn't plan to Sunday night, but it kind of got out of the banks a little bit. But uh, 
These are the things you have to do. You have to have these principles in place, whether it's an incurable disease or it's an impossible relationship or it's a shortage in your life that you need, uh, that there's needs that are there that need to be met or if you're seeking wisdom for a decision that is life altering, you need these principles in your life and it takes all of them. It won't work with just one of them. It won't work with just one of them. It takes all of them working together. Well, what are they? Let's look. First of all, verse 28, the three words I ask you to underline, for she said. The first thing when you're approached with situations that seem impossible, noticed. My first, I'll just have two words for each point. Say it. Say it. What did she say? Well, for she said, if I may touch but his clothes, I shall be whole. She said it. Who'd she say it to? I don't know if she said it to anybody. I think personally she said it to herself because I don't think anyone would come around her because they would consider her unclean. So I think she's talking to herself. You know, sometimes you need to have a good talk with yourself. Don't do it around others because they'll think you lost your mind. But you just gotta sit down and say, now wait a minute, I've gotta get a hold of this thing because I know nothing will happen until I say it the way God says it in his word. So you have to say it. There's something about the power of speaking. She could not have somebody else do this for her. Nobody could have faith for her. She had to do it herself. She had to say it to herself. That means in the morning when you get up and face whatever you're facing that seems impossible, when no one is around, you say it. God, God is always faithful and true. And the devil is always a liar. And all of this is in God's hand. And you need to say it. God will. You have to say it. There's something about the power of, of speak. Turn to Mark chapter 11. Mark chapter 11, verse 23. Let, let, me, let me stress what I'm trying to say here. Mark 11, 23, you know this passage well. Jesus speaking on faith. Mark eleven twenty three. 23, for verily I say unto you that whosoever shall, what's the next word? Say unto this mountain, be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he, what's the next word? Saith shall come to pass he shall have whatsoever he, what's the last word? Say it. That's a three to one ratio. One for the Father, one for the Son, one for the Holy Ghost. Say it, say it, say it. Now here's where we get into problems because some people, they just want to claim it and they stop right there. He says you have to have faith and you have to say it. If you don't believe God's word, then nothing else will work for you. There's nothing that's gonna work. You have to say it without saying it and you have to say it for yourself. Here's where we get in trouble. Too many believers, Christians, they're frantic today if they can't get a hold of the preacher or some other Christian to say it for them. But I can't say the words of faith for you any more than I can say the words of faith for salvation for you. I can't say the words of faith for deliverance for you. You have to say it. I can pray for you 25 times a week at this altar, but it won't happen until you say. You have to say. Why do I have to say it? Because there's something encouraging when we hear our own voice say, thank God he has all power and the Lord is in control. There's something encouraging inside of us when we say it. So we have to say it. It is a Bible pattern. The Lord commands that we speak. 
Hey, turn to Joel chapter three, and if you don't want to turn there, it's a small book, I know. That it's not something you read frequently, but you'll know the passage that I'm going to read. In fact, it's on one of our government buildings, but uh, they, they're going to try to get it off, trust me, because they don't want anything that's true on anything. They want to change it all. But, but listen, Joel chapter three and verse, verse 10. Joel chapter three and verse 10. You remember, well, beat your plowshares into swords and your pruning hooks into spears, but you never hear the last part of the verse. Let the weak say, I am strong. I'm telling you, we had more Bible when I was a kid going to Bible school than what most churches have as a body today. Because in Bible school, they taught us constantly, I am weak, but he is strong. And the Lord is saying, you're looking at your might and your power, and you know your weakness, and you know your inabilities, but he's saying here, you need to say to the enemy, I may look like I'm weak, but you trust me. There's something down inside of me that just won't quit and won't give up. And even though I'm weak, and let all the weak say, I am strong. That means that when you go through it, even though the cancer is still there, you say, I am healed. Now oh, that didn't go over very good. That means when you're facing a situation that's impossible, you say, with God all things are possible to them that believe. You say it, say it. The woman received what she got because she confessed it. I don't believe she would have got it if she didn't confess it. She confessed her deliverance. Now that's not what everyone else was confessing. While she was confessing, if I may get to him, if I can just touch, touch his garments, if I can, the other, the other gospel writer said the hem of his garment, if I can just touch something connected to him, I know that I'll be healed. Everybody else was saying, don't you confess your healing? You be making funeral plans, lady. There's no doctor that can help you. They're saying you need to confess the fact that you're dead, you're dying. But instead she's saying, if I can just get to Jesus, if I can just touch him, if I can get to where he's at, and if I say it, I mean it. Because the power is not only saying it, but saying it with the real need. So you have to say it. But whole denominations are built on point one. But that's all they do is talk. Talk. You say, well, the power of life and death is in the tongue. Yes. And also our salvation lies in the, in the tongue. With the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. You have to say it. You have to say it. That's why you could come up here unsaved all you want to and come to this altar and keep coming to this altar, but sooner or later, you're gonna have to, by faith, confess your salvation or you'll never experience it. That doesn't go over very good, but you do. You have to confess it. But not only confess it, but I want you to notice something else. It also says in verse 27, see, these verses are somewhat flip-flopped because it tells us what she said after that she did it. But really she said it and then did it. <laughs> because if you look at verse 28, very plainly she said, if I may. But uh, So really this was before she touched him. So first she said it, but in verse 27, when she heard of Jesus, came in the press behind and touched his garment. First you gotta say it. Second of all, you gotta do it. First she said, if I may but touch his clothes. But hallelujah, she did it. If she would have said it and not done it, she wouldn't have been healed. So she could watch Jesus pass by and say it all she wanted to. Uh, if I may but touch, touch the hem of his garment, if I may but touch his clothes, I'll be made whole. But she did more than say it, she did it. And you've also not only got to that place where you say it, 
You've got to do it. You remember in Luke 17, the 10 lepers, when they came to the Lord, Jesus told them, go show thyself unto the priest. And the Bible says, and as they went, they were cleansed. They could have said we're cleansed, but they'd still been lepers until they did it. That's why a lot of people are lost because they know the Bible in and out, but they won't do it. They know the gospel, but they won't obey the gospel. So you can't only say it, but you gotta do it. I can't stand up here and say one thing and preach one thing and do something else. It makes my preaching mean nothing if I'm saying one thing and doing something else. But if I say it and do it, that's what makes the difference. You not only have to say it, but you have to do it. Words are empty and meaningless without corresponding actions in our life. Say it, do it. And then verse 29, straightway the fountain of her blood was dried up and she felt in her body that she was healed of that plague. You gotta say it, you gotta do it, and then you gotta receive it. Nobody else out of that whole crowd except her and Jesus knew what had happened. Some people say, oh, what? The Lord didn't know. Sure, he felt virtue go out. Do you really believe Jesus didn't know who it was? Do you know what he was saying to his disciples? He was trying to tell them, hey, you guys are asleep at the wheel. There's big things happening right here under your nose and you don't even know it. There's great things. It's kind of like our church. I, everywhere I go, people two, three, four, five, six hours away. I want to move to Rubyville so I can go to church and we can't hardly get people right here. That's part of the church to come. You know why? They don't know what we've got. It's not because of us, but you trust me. You travel a few places I go and sit through a few meetings that I sit in and it won't take you very long to know God's doing something right here. And if we say it and if we do it and if we receive it and say, Lord, we want all that you have. She felt in her body that she was healed. Now isn't that something? Jesus didn't tell her she was healed, but she knew she was healed. I don't think she checked to see if the bleeding stopped, but she knew she was healed. It's kind of like getting saved. The truth of the matter is when you really get saved, nobody has to tell you you're saved. When you really receive it, you'll know it. Somebody as big as God move in your heart and take over and you not know that he's there and you not know that the weight of sin is lifted. I'm telling you, when you receive it, you know it. I jotted down a little statement. You, you, you may like it, you may hate it, but I love it. Healing and feeling followed her saying and doing. Healing and feeling followed her saying and doing. She said it, she did it, she received it, she felt it. <laughs> I don't know, you may be different than what I am, but I've never gotten over the grace that I'm under. I have never forgotten what God has done for me. And he just continues to do more and more and we receive it. When we receive it, it changes everything. It doesn't mean that you're gonna escape troubles and trials, but trust me, when you face the surgery, you'll face the surgery differently if you've received it. You've received the peace of God that passes understanding and you can say, it doesn't matter. I'm gonna win, it doesn't matter. It's gonna be fine, everything's okay. Receive it. So say it, do it, receive it. God 
always has an order to everything he does. Everything. In creation, there was an order. When Noah built the ark, there was order to the plan, to the design. When it came time for the animals to come on the ark, there was order. When God gave the pattern for the tabernacle to Moses, there was order. When God gave the pattern to David and then Solomon built the temple, there was order. Everything was put in place. When Jesus fed the multitude, he set them down in companies and in rows and there was order to the way that he took care of the miracle. The miracle came when they followed the order. He has an order for us. Now let me ask you, how many of you like to really feel good in God tonight? I mean, feel so good that it'd make you leave this place feeling like a 16 year old again. And for those of you that's under the age of 16, make you leave feeling like you already had your driver's license. (laughs) Wouldn't you like that? Well, there's an order to it. What's the order? Number one, if you're gonna receive it, you gotta know the facts. The facts are God is a God of order. He does things decently and in order. He's got a plan. You gotta step into his plan, into his order. So first you follow the facts. Then when you've got the facts, you've got to operate by faith. I would say out of that multitude that were thronging him. I don't know how many, but I'm, I hope that I'm not, God knows my heart, I'm not trying to read anything into scripture. There's a reason why they were following him. A demoniac that they couldn't control has just been delivered. They've seen the power of God. So now they have all of their needs and they're throwing him. I think a lot of those people were throwing him because they had something they needed from Jesus. That's why they were there. Maybe they had loved ones that were possessed of devils. Maybe they had relationships that had been broken. Maybe they had homes that had been destroyed. Maybe they had sickness in their body. Maybe they had loved ones that were near death. I don't know why, but I think they were throwing because they knew he's the answer. Even though they hadn't received it, they knew. But out of all of those that are throwing him, why do we only read of this one woman? I don't know how big the crowd was, but it had to be a pretty good sized crowd because it mentions twice that they thronged him and that there was a press. I mean, that's the kind of crowd that people get stomped to death in when you talk about a press. It's like when they can't get into their favorite event or something happens at that event and they get crushed because of the crowd. It was that kind of a crowd that was there. And here's a woman that's unclean, weak in body, been sick for 12 years, but yet somehow she gets through all of that. They thronged him. But the only one we read about was the one that had faith to touch him. So wanting it and by faith saying it, doing it and receiving it is different. That's what will set you apart. Other people will just talk about what they want, what they want. But when you really learn these principles and see how they interlock, then others are going to look and say, how did they do that? How did they do that? Because first comes the facts. Next comes the faith. But when you take the facts, well, what's the facts? That's it. That's the sum of all of it right there. No hidden truth. Nothing more added to it. Nothing taken away from it. This is the facts. So when we come with the word of God, armed with the word of God, the promises of God, by faith, we receive the promises of God. We meet the condition that God gives us. Guess what happens? Faith gets together with facts 
and you start feeling something. What people want is they want the feeling without facts. They want the feeling without knowing the Bible. They want to call the preacher and say, preacher, you, you got to come and take care of this. But I can't, again, I want to stress this. I can't have faith for you. If you are facing something that is evil or demonic, I'm not going to be with you 24 hours a day. But here's the facts. I don't have any more of God than you have. Now he may have more, we, we may give him more of us. But when it comes to God, he's God for every one of us. I don't serve a God of more power and you serve a God of lesser power. He's God and he has all power. That's the facts. That's what he said in his word. And when you tap into faith, what do I do? You say to that mountain, be plucked up and cast in the sea. Not by my power, by the authority of the word of Jesus Christ. And then all those bad feelings leave. But as long as you hit and miss church and you dabble in the word of God here and there and you piecemeal and read little portions of scriptures here and there and don't learn what the Bible says, you'll have a feeling occasionally, but all it is is a spillover from somebody else. <laughs> Can I tell you something? I love every one of you. I do. But I really don't care how you feel tonight. I feel fine. I feel fine. I feel content that I'm in the center of God's will. I feel peace that God gives me the messages to preach to try to help myself, whether it helped you, you go to it and enjoy it if it can help you. If not, I feel fine. I don't need you to smile at me. I don't need you to amen me. I don't need you to shout. I don't need you to do anything to prove to me God's on the throne and that I'm gonna see him one day face to face and until then, I'm gonna live by faith and not by sight and I'm gonna trust him and I'm gonna stand on the promises of his word. When you do that, it'll be fine. So you gotta say it. You gotta do it. You gotta receive it. And if it's okay, I'll give you one more real quick. You gotta tell it. What do you mean tell it? Well, let's look down in verse 33. Jesus knew who it was. He even looked around in verse 32 about to see her that had done this thing. He knew exactly who it was. But the woman, fearing and trembling, knowing what was done in her, came and fell down before him and told him all the truth. Hmm. She said it, that's the confession. She did it, that's the obedience. She received it, that's faith. But then she told it. She testified to it. She testified to what was done. I'm the one. He knew she was the one, but he still wanted to hear it. Now, why is, why is it so important that we tell it? Well, when we tell it, we spread the word about his presence. And this is why I say principles are missing. This is the part that misses more. I, I go into some churches, they'll say it. I go to some churches, they won't say it, but they'll do it. I go into some churches, they'll say it and do it, but they won't receive it. But then I go into some, they'll say it, they'll do it, they'll receive it, but they never tell it. I'm not saying, hey, look at me. Look at what I've done. No, you've got to spread the word. Well, spread the word about what? God's presence. The Bible over and over says, and it was noised that Jesus was in the house. Herod didn't know anything about Jesus, but he heard. And the Bible says that the fame of Jesus went throughout the land. How did Herod know? He'd never seen him, he didn't know what he looked like, but he heard about him. Somebody told 
Herod about, there is a man in your kingdom that he is unbelievable. He is doing things. He's speaking like no man has ever spoken. He's teaching like no man has ever taught. He's doing the miraculous. I'm telling you, where he's at, things are happening. That's why it's important for us to tell it. You know what I've done since Sunday night? Everywhere I've gone, you know what I've done? Hey, you need to go online to Sunday night service. Uh, uh, why? I, I, I haven't watched it yet. Oh, you need to go online to Sunday night service. It's not because of anything that any one of us did. He was here. He showed up. His pre- spread the word about his presence. Spread the word and tell people, you ought, to, you ought to come, I'm telling you, the Lord is faithful to show himself and reveal himself. And if we don't want him to show up and we don't tell others the presence of the Lord is here, when they really have a need, they're not gonna know where to turn or where to go. It's not that we're the only one, but we ought to say, he is here. And you ought to spread the word about his power. Where he's at, things are happening. Testifying to his power does two things. First of all, by telling it, it confirms it to ourself. That means it uplifts us. That means you get over the droopies and the punies. (laughs) Hard to talk about Jesus and keep a frown on your face. It just really is. It's hard to talk about the goodness of the Lord and not put a smile on your face or to brighten up on the inside. And when you brighten up on the inside, you brighten up on the outside. I know we all go through stuff, but you go through stuff too long and it'll get the best of you. You need to uplift yourself. And how you uplift yourself is you testify about the things that God has done. And if God has done it, he can do it again and he can do things that we've not yet dreamed of or seen happen. It confirms it to ourselves, And then too, I think we need to confess it to others because it encourages others. Now think with me for one moment, and I'm gonna close with this. Had she not confessed it, had she not said it, had she not had the principle of do it, had she not received it, if she didn't tell it, I mean, after all, why does he do what he does for us? He wants us to tell him things. It's what he wants. Let me show you the power of those four principles working together as a foundation in our life. Put ourselves in her condition. No doctor has the cure. No man, no woman can help. No religious figure, no priest, no rabbi can help. No neighbors can help. She's now out of money, out of strength, and out of options. Had she not said that, had she not done that, had she not received that, had she not talked about that, do you really think this story would be in the Bible? Hear this, and I'm going to close with it. If we were like that woman, we'd learn this lesson. Our words will either bring us to life or bury us. I'm not talking about the power of positive thinking. I'm talking about the power of a positive God. Our words will either kill us or raise us up. As long as we remain perfectly happy, 
being who we are with what we are, hear me if you're in your sin. You will not ever, 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 ever be saved until you say it, do it, receive it, and tell it. Wait a minute, preacher. Hey, I went to the altar. I prayed. I believe that Jesus is Lord. I received his salvation. You know how many churches, and I'm sorry, but I don't believe it's sound doctrine. They stop there, and that's why we've got so many people that's in and out. Because telling it is the seal of approval. Is that true, preacher? Well, you interpret this for me. Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before the Father. That means in the end, and I realize you may not, you may not verbally be able to, you could be on a ventilator, but from your heart, you can look to those around if you are conscious and you have to be conscious. That's, that's dangerous because you can be at a place where you can't hear and you can't respond. Not physically, but from your heart and your soul. But you, if you're at that place where you still can respond, you can be like the thief on the cross. He confessed it. Confess what? <laughs> this man's done nothing amiss. We receive our due reward. He knew he was a sinner. You've got to get to the place where you're willing to say, I'm going to tell it. They'll come with a song while they're coming. I, don't, I wouldn't embarrass anybody for anything, but one of the sweetest things, Candy and I, we've got, we've got great neighbors. We really do. We've got, I don't know if Tristan's here tonight or not. Uh, don't go home and embarrass your mom and dad. But uh, Carl and Kendra have been absolutely role model neighbors. They may not have been Christians, but I'm telling you, the best neighbors that anybody could ever ask for. And we've just been blessed. But I remember they, uh, he got, him and her got saved, I think it was a week ago Sunday, up, up at Christ's brother, and I hope I've got the date right. But when Candy and I, Candy saw him first, we hadn't had a chance to talk yet, and to be honest, I wasn't gonna say anything. I wanted to see what he had to say. And uh, Candy got to talking to him. And when I walked up, boy, big tears welled up in his eyes. And he said, you know, God been working on me a long time, Cal. And he said, but I'm telling you, isn't it something how the Lord works things out? Amen. Said he just put everything in the right place. And he said, man, the only thing I regret is that I didn't do this sooner. And I said, but Carl, you did it. And you're telling others about it. And every time we tell others about it, we get stronger in our faith, stronger in our faith. I don't know why. Play softly, if you will. Every head bowed. I feel led to ask this tonight. Is there somebody here that if you died right now, I'm not asking you, are you a member of a church? Are you a good person? Are your parents saved? I'm not asking any of those things. I'm asking you, if you were to meet the Lord this very moment, do you know that you have said it, said it confessed your sins to him, not to me, another preacher, confessed your sin to him? That you did what you should do. You came to Jesus and you received his salvation. Have you told someone that you're saved? I'm glad you did one step. I'm glad you did two steps. I'm glad you did three. But the truth of the matter, you remember what I said in the beginning? It's interlocking. It takes a foundation around all four walls of this building to hold the building up. And it takes all four 
for you to really have the life that's built up in faith. And if there's someone here tonight that you look at and you say, you know, I, I, I don't remember. I, I don't remember telling it. I remember going forward, but I don't remember receiving it. I don't remember doing that, preacher. I've never said that. You're looking at your heart and you don't have peace. Nobody's looking on. You just raise your hand where you're at and say, pray for me because I need peace with God. Joining a church, just joining a church doesn't give you peace with God. Joining the family of God is what gives you peace with God. Peace comes because we're away from Christ and we're separated from Christ. And if there's someone here tonight, sincerely, you'd say, pray for me. I need the Lord. I need the Lord. God bless you. Somebody else, just raise your hand right now. You can take it right back down. Somebody else, up in the balcony, down on the floor. Somebody else, you'd raise your hand right now. God bless you. Someone else. Someone else. God bless you. I see your hand there. God bless you. Somebody else, just raise your hand. Raise your hand. Pray for me. Pray for me. Pray for me. Please, nobody else looking on. Please. I know this is Wednesday night. I know what night it is. But I know what God is doing here tonight. The same principles that brought our salvation are the same principles that help us in the time of need of deliverance in our life. It works. It works to save you. It works to supply for you. It works to strengthen you. I'm glad you raised your hand. Please, nobody, nobody looking on. I promise you that. If you raised your hand, would you just look right here at me for one moment? Nobody else is looking on. You're not going to be embarrassed. Just lift your head and just look right here at me for one moment. Would you do that? Just look up here. One moment. Nobody else is looking on. I'm glad you raised your hand. But the truth is the truth. This could be the last service you ever sat in. This could be the last sermon you ever hear. And the song you're about to hear could be the last song you ever hear, hear sung. And while you raised your hand, you did it. You said it. I need the Lord. But now, will you do it? Will you get out of your seat? Will you come and receive him? And when you receive him, Will you tell those that gather with you the only thing they want to hear you say is I'm saved. Jesus is my Savior. Do more than raise your hand. And for those of you that are believers that you're fighting something that you need help from the Lord, you ought to come. Let's stand together. Brother Howard leads us in a song. Will you come? Will you come right now? Will you come? Come right on. Page come right 40, on. Praise 40. God. Praise God. Why don't you come? If you're inside one of the rows of pews, just step out. They'll let you out. They can come with you. You'll not be alone. You come. You come. Some of you have friends with you that need the Lord. You should invite them. You should tell them what the Lord's done for you. Tell them the Lord saved you. And the Lord loves them just as much as he loves you. He'll save you. He'll forgive you. Will you come? Will you come? Why don't you come right now? Nobody can have faith for you. You have to put your faith in action. 
will you call? Trust and obey. Why don't you come right now? I tell you, if you take that first step, the next step would get easier. There's something about doing it. You can't just say, Lord, I know you can. Lord, I know what I need. And God bid you to come to him and you not do it. Will you do it? Say it. Do it. Receive it. Tell it. Will you come? Will you come? They're still praying. I believe God giving someone that extra time, that extra space of grace to come. Say yes to the Lord. He will help you, but you have to want him. Will you come? Will you come? Let him. You are your own worst enemy. So easy to talk yourself out of it. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> Praise God. Oh, Lord, give me peace tonight. In Jesus' name. God bless you. God bless you. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. I'm telling you, there's a couple others. You raised your hand, too. You ought to come. You ought to come right now. You didn't even lift your hand but way down inside. You say, I do not have that peace with God. But tonight it's changing. I'm coming to the Lord. Will you trust? Will you obey? Trust and obey. It's the only way. Gotta keep seeing folks are still coming. You come, you come. Hallelujah, Lord. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Lord, I bless your name. Glory to God. Glory to God.
trust and obey. Trust and obey. They're still praying. Oh, God leaves that door open for you. Will you come? Right now, will you come? you maybe couldn't hear, let's welcome Mark to the family of God. Hallelujah! Don't you feel better tonight? Facts and faith is what yields the feelings. We want to be praying for Mark this week, praying for these others that were on the altar and those that should have come and didn't pray for them. When you face something this week, something that seems impossible. I hope that you'll remember, say it, do it, receive it, tell it. Praise God, praise God. In the Lord good to us. Speaking of telling it, go out and tell everybody about Church Sunday. Let them know, Rubyville's on fire, come and watch it burn. And uh, God's doing great things and we praise him for it and just keep praying for these that need the Lord. Mike uh, Simpson and his son Seth are in revival uh, the next three nights up at Charity Free Will Baptist at Clarktown. That's the next town north on 139. So be praying for the revival if you can be there to support them any of those nights. Uh, that would be absolutely wonderful. Pray for me if you would. I'll be down at Charleston in meeting starting tomorrow night and uh, be back here for Sunday morning uh, to preach and looking forward to what God has for us on Sunday. But if I'm not here Sunday and I'm gone from this world, don't fret for me. I know, I know where I'm headed. And I told you Sunday night, I know what they're doing in heaven right now. And we're gonna get to be a part of that. And if you know the Lord, you will too. Great to have you out tonight. Thank you. Easter Cave starts this weekend. If you didn't get a bulletin, pick one up. I'm sure there's probably some still back that has a listing of the times or else you can check their site at White Gravel Mines and be praying for the Easter Cave. God bless you. You're dismissed.